Hello and welcome to this midweek time of worship at First Lutheran. My name is Jason Stanton. I serve as senior pastor here at First, and I'm glad you have found us. A couple announcements. One is that First Fest, our annual launch to a program year, is coming up September 12th. That's a Sunday. We have one worship service at 930 for everybody uh, outside, as weather permits. And after worship, we're going to have inflatables, uh, for the kids, I suppose adults can maybe uh, partake in that too, and we'll have food. It's a great time to come as a, a guest. Maybe you haven't worshipped with us before or haven't been here in person, or maybe you're a longtime member uh, who would feel most comfortable worshipping outside. Uh, invite a neighbor, invite a friend. Uh, that's what First Fest is for. And then September 17, 18, 19 is our First Lutheran Play Days at Sugar Creek Bible Camp. We've done this uh, one other year, and so we're doing this a, a second time. Again, lots of outdoor family, and you don't have to be a family. Uh, fun. It's really for all generations. If you want to know more about how to participate that Friday night or just Saturday or maybe just Sunday morning as we'll have a worship service down there, uh, or if you want to come for part or all of it, call uh, the church office. Tamara will help you uh, know what's available and what, what it all is. And then September 26th is our first Sunday of Sunday school. And all the precautions and whatnot that we'll be taking, we'll name those when we get closer to those actual times. If you are worshiping with us on Sunday, know that we are, again, uh, masking for worship on Sunday at 8 and 10 o'clock until First Fest on the 12th, and we'll see what's going on then. Okay, Wednesday worship, by the way, since some of you uh, tuning in are, are uh, Wednesday worshipers, we will be in person 615 starting September 15th. Uh, and again, watch for mask requirements as we get closer to that date. And so as a time to enter into worship, uh, I thought we, it would be best to, to start out by singing, and so I invite you to sing with me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I invite you into a time of confession to be reminded of God's forgiveness. 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, we confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and you are nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there's always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you're shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into life abundant. Amen. And so we pray, ever loving God, your Son gives Himself as living bread for the life of this world. Fill us with such a knowledge of His presence that we may be strengthened and sustained by His risen life to serve you continually. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our text for this day is, well, we continue into John chapter 6. We're reading John chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I'll give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I'll raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true blood, true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. One of the skills that makes us human is our advanced ability to problem solve. We can think our way into and out of just about anything. Our ancient ancestors thought up new ways of making tools. The Mayans of Central America followed the sun and created a calendar based on the sun's movements. Greeks, those ancient Greeks, they thought so much that a lot of their thinking was thinking about thinking. Romans solved engineering problems, bringing water and heat and roads to every corner of their empire. Einstein's theory of relativity challenges us to think outside the realm of time and light. Forms of government have been toppled because of a thinking public. Worlds have literally been explored from worlds away. Thought can take us just about anywhere. It can bridge cultures with thoughtful writings. It can bridge continents with thoughtful engineering. The most helpful picture I could think of as you listen to me today is I want this image to be in your mind. Your image would be of the thinker. Maybe you know that sculpture. Sculpted toward the end of the 1800s, the thinker encapsulates much of what drives humanity. Thought takes us places. Can we think our way to God? That's my question for today as I wrestle with this part of John chapter 6. 
Is that what a relationship with God requires? Proper thought. Like if we don't think right, sorry. Biblically speaking, there have been many tries at this idea. I think we need to eat that apple. I think we need to build a tower to God. I think, maybe Moses would say, a golden calf would, would work better than you, Lord. Or actually, Moses wouldn't say that, Aaron would. But I think we need a king, the Israelites were saying. David, you'll do. The Jewish authorities in our gospel lesson for this week ask, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? In other words, I don't think the Messiah would say this. God's children have always given God a second and a third and a fourth thought, thinking about how real God's love could truly be. How strong can this God really be? And how does this God do God's stuff anyway? And so we have, even in our own day, we have people trying to, to think their way to God and then think through why God does what God does. I, I think God lives on the back of that comet, thought a few people a couple decades ago. And so if we all die tomorrow, we can catch a ride on it. That was a thought. Or I think there has to be a nation of Israel in order for Jesus to return. So let's defend it no matter what. Or I think the second coming is coming on New Year's 2000. Remember that theory? And then it was, uh, maybe we got the numbering wrong. Maybe it's actually 2001. Maybe it's 2022. Who knows? But the church itself started to really think, and I say the church meaning all the church, not just the clergy, but, but lay people too. The whole church started to think around the Reformation 500 years ago. For almost 1,500 years, priests had been able, for the most part, and been allowed to think for everybody. But then Luther, Martin Luther, had some thoughts of his own. He thought that Scripture should be more authoritative than anything or anyone else in the church, that the grace of God is more powerful than anything or anyone else, that the faith of Christ all by itself is what connects us to God and to each other. And he based all these thoughts on Scripture. Following his lead, others thought some too, thinking, which was really not allowed for lay people before this, changed everything about the church. What should worship sound like? Who gets to pray to God? What's the relationship between the church and government? What does baptism really mean? What's truly happening at communion? Not everybody had really thought about this before. Luther did and invited everyone else to join him. And for the most part, in the end, Luther used thought to explain the actions of the church. He disagreed with very little, actually. Many who followed him, however they thought differently. They were using thought to change what the church was about. The best example I have, which I bring up because of the way it ties in, it ties in with this part of John chapter 6, is communion. Luther got in trouble for thinking and saying many of the things he did, so he and his cohorts, they wanted to write an explanation of their thoughts, hoping that it would prove to the Roman church of their day that they weren't heretics, they weren't crazy people, they weren't disagreeing with much of anything. They were simply good Christians interested in being more thoughtful about what and who the church is in the world. Rumor had it at the time that Luther had radically different views about some very important things. Communion was one of them. And so, in the Augsburg Confession, it says, we know that the Roman church affirms the bodily presence of Christ in the Mass. We defend this doctrine that in the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Christ are truly and substantially present and are truly offered with those things that are seen, bread and wine. Lutherans, then, have always believed that what we eat at communion is the body and blood of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah from Nazareth, who after dying was raised for all, 
we say that He is really present in Holy Communion. But there were others, of course, who kept thinking otherwise, thinking long and hard about how this could be. How could wine and bread, which still looks like, smells like, and tastes like wine and bread, how could that be Jesus? Unable to figure out how that could happen, many started explaining communion as something less than a real encounter with God. Instead, it became a symbol of God. When you see this bread and when you see this wine, it should help you think your way to God. Kind of like the Statue of Liberty helps us think about freedom. Just as a picture of a beloved dead friend helps us think about how our lives intertwined and, and what some of those moments were like. Communion then would, would be meant to help us think about Jesus. In which case, I suppose I should say something like, at communion, I, I would say something like, this is like my body given in a way for you. Do this to remember me. This is kind of my blood which was shed for you then. Do this to remember me. Christ hopes these cardboard wafers and sweet red wine would help you to think hard, hard enough so that you might really encounter God in some other way that I'm not sure how. You know, one of the snags with this symbol idea is that we hope you are not especially mad at God this week or, or doubting God at all this week because you might not, actually probably won't, achieve a presence with Jesus through your thoughts. Thinking is limited. It's a gift. God gave us brains to think with so that we could love each other more fully than any other creature can. But somewhere along the way, pretty early on, actually, as Adam and Eve were already misusing thought in the garden, humans have always tried to outthink God, wanting to know how and why and when to questions that we aren't even qualified to ask. This is why the Jews ask, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And that's why Jesus responds, not with a, a recipe of explanation or a theological dissertation, but instead, he just doubles down and says it again. He proclaims it again. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. We want to think about how can this be. We want the mysteries of this world explained why some die while others live, how time can seem to stand still but also scurry away all, all at once. We want explanations for injustice and pain and love, but most of all throughout the ages, we want to know how God is almighty. In our daily tasks that tempt us to betray the people and values we love most, in the ways we work, in the ways we love in the world, and in the ways we live, how can we earn God's presence in this life of ours? Or as the Jews say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? How can the distance between God and us be made up? How can a man become God? How can his flesh be bread from heaven meant to feed us through all the hunger we've ever known in this life or ever will know in death? How can we be brought to wisdom? And to all these how and why and when questions, Jesus simply says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. We need not think any more than that. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church and the world and all of creation. Loving God, 
Help us to live in mystery in the midst of so much unknown that frustrates us, intrigues us, and challenges us. Help us to simply, with childlike faith, believe that you are truly present in the bread and the wine, that you do abide with us at all times and in all places. Despite what we think, what we do, you choose to be with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for all we know who are suffering in any way. We especially this day pray for the entire nation of Haiti in the wake of political assassination and an earthquake, a tropical storm, the absence of real support. God, we pray for your church in Haiti, that it would continue to be a source of strength and sustenance for people who are injured, for those who hunger or are without shelter. We pray for the nation of Afghanistan, that all refugees would find safety and solace, that nations in the West would see any suffering and choose to provide for whatever needs they have. God, bless all of those people we know who are suffering that we could name before you. We, we name Todd and Lori and all who are suffering with cancer. For Caitlin and Lucy and Josh, for Ross. Hear the names of those others we name to you now. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we worship out of gratitude this day as well. Grateful for these continuing beautiful summer days that we get to enjoy. Bless our gatherings with safety. Keep us well. And make us whole, God, in all the ways that we may feel broken or distant from you or each other. Remind us of the reconciliation and wholeness that you offer in the faith of Jesus, believing that we are indeed forgiven, that we are your body in this world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Be at peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.